All right, everyone. Um, hello. Um, we're going to be getting started shortly. And as you are getting to this um, stage or the event, go ahead and um, type one if you could hear us and, and see us. And also, we would love to know the name of your company. Go ahead and type the name of the comp of your company in the chat, please. Hi, Rich. Hi, Alexa. Hey, Trudy. Met hey, Isabel. Metatron. Okay. Hi, Mosin. SBDC. Awesome. Geneva Company. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, Elizabeth. Awesome. Okay, so I am, hi Trudy. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, wow, the chat is all the way live. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So today I'm excited um, because Nick is gonna talk about how COVID changed consumer behavior and how we should pivot. So a little bit about this session is, as we all know, COVID has changed the life, life, you know, there's a new normal. And with any great change, business must pivot. So today, Nick is going to go over four primary shifts in consumer behavior and how marketing strategy would help us adjust to, to those shifts. A little bit about Nick. He is the co-founder of m &R Marketing, which is a full service marketing agency located in downtown Macon. Um, MNR recently made the Inc. OK 5000 list. That's awesome. And is a pre previous recipient of the Greater Macon Chambers Small Business of the Year. He is married and um, recently celebrated the birth of his first child. Congrats, Nick. So take it away. Okay. Um, well, everybody, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of Macon Startup Week. And uh, thank you for being on this session. Uh, we are going to be talking about um, how COVID changed consumer behavior and um, how that can cause us to need to pivot in certain ways within our, within our business. Um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning or this afternoon is a lot of what we experienced as a company uh, living through COVID. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest things to, just to start off with that we learn is how important it is to be able to be nimble in your business and to be ready to change when the circumstances surrounding your business necessitate that you do change. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to share that that we went through internally uh, to help identify what need to be changed uh, because of COVID, um, we probably responded too slowly on. Um, you know, looking back, there are a lot of things that I feel like we probably should have responded and, and been more nimble uh, than we were. Um, but so a lot of what I'm going to share is just the things that that we went through um, and what we learned um, and. Uh, Big picture is just always looking at ways in which you can create systems and processes in your businesses that allow you to be nimble and allow you to be ready when uh, change is necessary. Um, one of the things that helped us a lot when COVID, uh, when the pandemic first started, um, was we had a little bit of experience with some of our team working from home. Um, so because of that, we had certain processes in place, certain systems in place, certain technology in place, um, with about 20% of our workforce was already in some form or fashion working from home. And so that really smoothed that transition process for us when we went 100% remote in the beginning. 
fortunately, we're now able to be back in the office, which is nice. Um, but having some of that stuff in place uh, allowed us to make that transition fairly smoothly and without any major hiccups. Um, but today, we're going to specifically talk about how COVID changed consumer behavior and then some of the pivots that we made um, and that we would talk to our clients about and, and helping them think through their marketing strategies. Um, so a few things. Um, first is we're going to talk about four main shifts that we discovered uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. The first one is frequency. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is the frequency at which um, our primary market and also the general public was consuming digital media. Um, some specific statistics um, compared to last year, there was a 38% increase of in-home data usage. A 38% increase, that's enormous. Um, and this was mostly attributed to the additional use of social media and video streaming services. Um, another uh, statistic is that Nielsen estimates it could increase by as much as 60%. So we could continue to, to see an increase in digital media consumption. Uh, web traffic, and this is coming from HubSpot, web traffic saw an increase of 13%. So the first thing that, that we discovered was this huge intake in di digital media consumption. The next thing that we looked at when we started thinking about our target market and the general public as a whole was where were they? The location. Um, remote work has soared. Um, in, in the beginning of the pandemic, it you know all, so many people were 100% working from home. Uh, even now, uh, you know, close to a year into the pandemic uh, and dealing with COVID, there's still a lot of people working from home. A lot of people working. And so we saw how remote work uh, went through the roof. Um, extracurricular activities, uh, they're just not as frequent as they used to be. Uh, there's been a significant decrease in things like sports and you know, Little League, taking the kids to the ballpark. Uh, church activities have decreased. Uh, travel, date nights. Uh, have been canceled and people just aren't doing it as much. I mean, even recently now with you know Thanksgiving, so many people spent their Thanksgiving you know just at home with their immediate family. And so we're continuing to see these effects continue to affect um, consumer behavior. Um, and so with you know with work from home on the rise and evening outs on the decline, there's just been unprecedented access to consumers in their homes um, that so that was one of the um, one of the, that was number two out of the four things that, that we saw as consumer behavior was shifting number three is attention and so although we knew that the market was anxious and they still are anxious about everything that was going on with covid um, they're still very attentive right now. Um, and we would see uh, a, a less cluttered inboxes. Um, things were a little bit less hectic because everything slowed down. But what we did notice is that for us specifically, business owners were still very focused on growth. Um, they weren't just sitting back. Um, and so we, we continued to see a very uh, focused target market, and they were looking at growth opportunities. And it really created a great opportunity for us. Um, even in the um, B2C market, because we're predominantly B2B, um, even though we have clients that are in the B2C market, um, even in the B2C market, people were, uh, were focused on growth for them specifically. 
you know, whether it was, you know, seeing how they could improve their skills from home, uh, a lot of research was being done. Um, and that really kind of goes into the next item. And this is number four of, of the four shifts that we saw. And that is um, people were doing so much research. Um, they were very proactive in researching ways to push through what they were being faced with and thinking about how to pivot. Um, people were spending so much more time on websites thinking through, you know, what can they do? Um, and people were doing this again, you know, even if, if you're more in a B2C market, uh, regular consumers were online researching a lot when uh, COVID first happened, and they still are today. Uh, that that trend has continued to, to a large degree. Um, but people are just at home, and they're online consuming digital media, and they're researching a lot. And so oftentimes what that meant is that the sales cycle lengthened a little bit. Uh, they were doing a lot of research, but not necessarily to buy immediately, but to buy in the future. Um, so for us, you know, a lot of our businesses, because they had extra time, because things had slowed so much, they were consuming media, they were online researching um, possible issues that they were having in their, in their uh, businesses. And, um, and then they were looking for solutions that they would implement. Um, so we just saw this huge uptake in customers researching brands more heavily online and initiating more online interactions uh, with businesses. Um, and so we started thinking through these ways in which we saw um, our market shifting uh, and in general consumer behavior shifting and we started thinking about well with these shifts what are some things that we can do to continue reaching out and continue promoting ourselves and also even our, our own clients and the first thing uh, that we thought through is how does this affect our messaging um, so, you know, that, this just really goes back to some of your basic marketing ideas. And that is knowing who you're going after and knowing what message you're going to use to go after them. And so that was one of the first things we thought about when we started seeing these, these shifts is what is the message? How does the message need to change? How does it need to be relatable to what's going on right now and sensitive to the current situation. It should offer hope. We should have resources for people. We should communicate a, a partnership that, that we wanted to um, uh, communicate to our clients and potentially new clients. Um, it should be conversational. And with the pandemic, when it first started, we realized that it did not need to be a, an immediate sales pitch at the time. It needed to have more understanding behind it um, and hit on some of those things like being relatable and, and being a, a resource during what was a very difficult time and still is uh, for so many of us. Um, so the messaging. Uh, another thing that we thought about with the messaging was as the buyer's journey lengthened, right? We talked about how people were researching a lot and it, it was extending uh, that, that cycle. Um, your messaging should be prepared to walk alongside a potential customer um, for a longer period of time. Um, and that means that your messaging should not just shift in tone and focus, but also in frequency. And so we, we really need to think about how can we stay in front of our audience uh, for longer um, sales cycles. And we didn't want to go dormant. Uh, we wanted to, to make sure that we were staying at the forefront of our market's uh, attention. Um, so a shift in messaging and really just sitting down and thinking through 
where is your market at right now? And from uh, from a psychographic standpoint, and how does your company, how does your business begin to engage them where they're at? Um, that was pivotal for us. And that was something we had to spend a lot of time thinking through in terms of how our messaging was going to shift to speak to them. Um, the, thing, the second thing that we uh, thought through uh, was a shift in targeting. Understanding who your market is and where they spend their time is one of the most important components to your marketing strategy. And uh, we, we had to, there was a major shift here. Um, with consumers visiting businesses uh, less often, uh, that was gonna impact some of our targeting uh, with certain platforms like geofencing. Um, you know, it could, it could it affect how you utilize certain uh, advertising channels in terms of thinking about is the market still in front of that ad platform? Um, you know, consumers being at home instead of at their businesses. So for us in the, in the B2B market, uh, we had to really take into consideration that a lot of the people that we would normally go after while they're at their business, they were no longer at their business. And so we had to think about how that shift shifts our uh, strategy and our efforts. Um, and we also had to think about um, the whole being at home and the media consumption at home. Um, and that how that shifted even our digital targeting. Um, so thinking about who your clients are, where they are, where they're spending their time, and how they're being affected by this affects where you want to be to target them. Um, and during COVID for us, uh, we shifted a lot of our targeting to include how could we target people at home. Um, and so that was a huge, huge shift uh, during COVID um, and still is today in, in many ways. Um, that then led to uh, changing and uh, adapting some of the platforms that we were using. Uh, we doubled down on some platforms and, and as we changed the targeting on those platforms. Um, so again, digital uh, during this time was a, was a big uh, tactic for us. Uh, social media, uh, blogs, e-newsletters, um, online uh, magazines and, and places to consume online content, uh, video uh, was huge. Uh, and as you think about how you're going to um, reach where your audience now is with the change in, in their behavior and, and people being at home more, we just went through those platforms and thought through how do you change the targeting on those platforms to reach people where they are? Um, and then thinking about the creative on those platforms and bringing that new messaging into those platforms and how it's going to reach them uh, with this new targeting on, on those digital platforms. Um, one big thing that we doubled down on is our remarketing efforts. Um, since we knew the sales cycle had extended and since, since we knew that um, people were spending more time in the research phase, uh, we wanted to make sure that on all these digital platforms, we were staying in front of them on a constant basis, even after they showed an in initial interest. And so we really doubled down on remarketing. And remarketing is one of those um, forms of marketing that it can be done simply and then it can also be done very complex. You can, you know, on your website, if you're not familiar with how remarketing works, um, the, the, the easiest way to describe it is, is when you get somebody to your website and they're on your website. When they leave your website, your ads continue to follow them 
and we've all experienced this. If, if you've been shopping at all online, you're shopping on J. Crew or, or Eddie Bauer or wherever you shop. When you go to Facebook or where you, when you go to some other website, those ads are following you, um, and that's remarketing. And, and and what that does is it, it keeps your brand and your company on your consumer, your audience, your target market's mind, um, and keeps you um, front and center. And we knew how important this was for us and for a lot of our clients with this extended sales cycle, uh, with people spending more time in research. We wanted to, to stay in front of them and remind them over and over. Um, and uh, one of the beautiful things about remarketing is that it can be so specific. It can be as specific as if somebody looks at, just hypothetically, service A or product A on my website, I can set up a specific remarketing campaign so that when they leave, they see ads and messaging and content specific to what they were looking at on my website. And so again, it can be very simple in how you use remarketing, or it can be as specific as when they look at service A or product A, they see ad messaging about service A and product A. Um, and it can follow them. And remarketing can follow people for a month. Um, it can follow people for up to a year on certain platforms. Um, so remarketing was something uh, that we really kind of doubled down on. And then the, another thing for us that we really had to think about is with the fact that so many of our customers were at home more and not in their physical business as much, we had to think about how that affected geotrend. And instead of using the, the traditional form of geofencing where you, where you uh, fence off a, a certain business, a certain address for a, a facility or a location, uh, we uh, pivoted to addressable geofencing, uh, which is a way you can, uh, it's, it's a little bit like a combination of, of creating a highly targeted um, direct mail list uh, where you can create a a audience profile based on certain demographics and certain psychographics. And then you can say, well, in you know, the middle of Georgia area, how many households meet that audience profile? And then you're able to create a, a geofencing campaign just on those households. And so for us, that was huge um, because we knew that our audience was at home. And so we were thinking about how can we reach people in their homes more? Um, you know, thinking about a lot of your streaming platforms like Hulu um, and some of the new ones that people are using more and more and how you can advertise on those platforms um, while they're at home um, and, and working from home. Even. Um, so a lot of it for us was really just kind of going back to the basics uh, and thinking about marketing and thinking about um, really going back and saying, you know, what's happening with our target market? Um, how are they changing because of the surrounding circumstances? Um, how has their life changed? How have their needs changed? Um, and then thinking about what's the messaging that we need to create to speak to them where they are now, then thinking through, well, how do we get in front of them where they are now? What platforms and what types of targeting are we going to use? Um, and, then, and then rolling that out. Um, so that was a lot of what we went through uh, when COVID first happened. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, is, is we had just developed, we had spent the past three months before COVID coming up with our new marketing plan, and then COVID happens, and we just kind of went crazy and had to refocus all over again on how it completely wrecked our initial marketing plan. Um, and uh, so much of it had to be redone completely. Um, and so we spent uh, about a solid week and a half to two weeks, uh, Matthew and I, 
just doubling down the marketing plan and making changes across all these things that I've just talked about. Um, so any questions, um, feel free to, to use the, the chat feature here. Um, I'm kind of going to open it up now for any type of questions that you have uh, about your business or about um, how COVID uh, has changed things with consumers and behaviors. Um, so. Great, um, friends. So go ahead and type your questions in the chat and I'll read them off to you, Nick. Um, sure. How do you find out where your target spends time? Your, I guess they mean target audience? Yeah, probably. Um, a lot of this is, is research. You know, uh, for us, we leaned on a lot of our uh, agency partners um, to discover what they were seeing. Um, so like uh, some of the statistics I gave you were from HubSpot. And so I'm not sure if you're familiar with HubSpot, uh, but that's a that's a, a account that we have and that we have an agency account with them. And so uh, when COVID first happened, you know, everybody is like circling the wagons, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, we utilize a lot, a lot of the larger companies like Google, Facebook, HubSpot, and we were tapping into all of the information that they were making available based on what they were finding. Um, so we were um, sitting in on different uh, conference calls with these companies um, and, and seeing what consumers were doing on those platforms. Um, so that was kind of how we approached that. We got a lot of information from our uh, partners um, and then, uh, you know, you can, you can go back to some of the basics as far as trying to discover where your target market spends time through, uh, just, um, um, focus groups, you know, and reaching out to people in your target market. Uh, it could be surveys, you know, uh, you know, something that requires less, uh, time as, as email surveys to your target market, people, people who are in your target market. Um, so different ways awesome. like that. So Teresa wants to know how does she get started with remarketing? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not sure what she means, but maybe it's re like remarketing your business or um, coming up with a digital, uh, It's a digital form of advertising. So um, remarketing can be done across many of your online digital platforms. So, you know, some examples are if you're running a Facebook ad campaign, you can set up remarketing uh, through Facebook ads um, so that if your Facebook ads are driving people to your website, when they go to your website and then they leave and go back to Facebook, your ads can continue following them on Facebook. Um, you can set up remarketing on, on just about any of those social digital ad platforms. So Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, all of those platforms, they're going to have some form of remarketing capability. You can also set up remarketing with Google Ads. Um, so if you're running a Google ad campaign, and uh, you can set up a remarketing campaign on Google as well. Um, Google's, Google's network of partner sites is, is probably the largest. They, they partner with over 2 million plus websites uh, that, that you can use uh, and they categorize these websites so that you can be a little bit more specific in terms of you want to make sure that your ads uh, are showing up on, you know, if you're in the home industry, you know, people who are looking at home related websites. Um, but Almost all of your digital marketing platforms will utilize some form of remarketing within those platforms. Okay. Um, and Trudy so. wants to know, how do you get access to geofencing? Can small businesses afford this method of marketing? 
Yeah, so um, we can, uh, so geofencing is something that different companies offer. Uh, you can go online and, and do a Google search uh, for uh, geofencing uh, companies. And uh, it's something that we offer here at MNR Marketing. Um, there are different price points for geofencing. Um, for us, it's a minimum spend of $1,000 a month. Um, there, there might be some companies that offer uh, lower um, spins. Um, geofencing, uh, the way the the way your budgeting works on geofencing is you're paying for a certain amount of views. Um, so for a certain budget, you're guaranteed that your ad is going to be seen this many times. Uh, it's a little bit different than something like um, Google Ads, where you have the possibility of paying per click. Um, with geofencing, it's usually a, a pay-per-view uh, type of uh, structure. Susanna wants to know, um, well, she said, thank you, Nick. Um, she wants to know, um, you mentioned wanting to meet people at home. How do you determine the ratio of online versus print marketing for your clients? <laughs> That's a great question, Susanna. Uh, we love print. Uh, M&R Marketing, uh, even though we do a lot of digital advertising, uh, we love print. Um, all the studies show that people retain print better than they retain digital. Uh, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, you know, the habit with digital is, is, is this right here. You're, you're quickly scrolling digital. And whenever we're looking at digital media, it's always just kind of a, you're moving through it pretty quickly. Where with print, you usually sit with it longer. And because of that, people remember things more with print. And so we try to think about how print gets incorporated into any strategy. Um, you know, it, it, it can oftentimes be used in uh, traditional ways with you know, magazine print and uh, billboard print um, and direct mail print. Um, but we always want to think about how does print and its different variations get incorporated into any marketing strategy. Um, because it is, it's, uh, even if you have a, a largely digital strategy, that does not mean that, that print uh, does not need to be thought through. Yeah. Um, we also have a question that, um, do you believe in creating content for all social media platforms or just where your target audience is? Yeah, you, you absolutely want to think about where your audience is going to be because the, the different platforms for social media do have some, some fairly specific audiences. Um, Facebook is, is probably the, the largest and the most diverse audience in terms of its makeup. Um, it's enormous compared to the other platforms, but um, you know, Instagram has a slightly uh, younger audience, um, and uh, you know, Pinterest is heavily female. Um, the uh, propensity to actually make a purchase on Pinterest or through Pinterest is very high compared to some of the other platforms. I believe Instagram is, is uh, second there uh, with people uh, driving purchases uh, on Instagram. Um, but every platform has a certain audience that, it, that, it, that is at its core. And so you definitely want to think through which platforms are most important for your audience. You know, if you're predominantly a, a B2B, uh, then you want to think about uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's a, it is a heavy, uh, predominantly B2B platform. Um, and so you want to think about how you could utilize that platform uh, in your efforts. So you always want to think about where your audience is. With any marketing that you do, you want to think about where your audience is. I have is. a question, Nick. So with the... Yes. You know, like sometimes you scroll through the social media platforms and you keep scrolling through sponsored posts, right? 
how do you stand out amongst your competitors as they are also um, um, doing the campaigns? Because I I remember during the beginning of COVID. Um, there were a lot of conversations around um, how now is the perfect time for you to like talk about your business virtually because the ads are lower at lower cost and things like that. But like if everyone is advertising, right? Like how do you stand out? Um, when people ask me that question, you know, how do you stand out? Um, the first thing that I think about is spending a lot of time diving into your target market, both demographically and psychographically. I, I feel like, you know, the better you understand who you're going after, the more likely you're going to come up with a message that gets their attention. Um, you know, so many people think that when it comes to marketing um, and advertising, that it just takes a really creative person and they're going to have this light bulb moment when they're going to come up with something that's just amazing and it's going to blow everybody's socks off. And that's not the way it happens. Um, great marketing takes a lot of research. And that research is largely focused on understanding who you're going after, understanding who they are through and through. And the better you know that, the better you can begin thinking about what's going to get their attention, what type of messaging, what type of creative is going to best get their attention. So for me, the, the answer to that is the better you know your audience, the more likely you're going to have message and creative that attracts your audience. So oh, thank you. Any more questions, guys? Oh, and also while we're at it, like how can people learn more about you or follow your work or anything you'd like us to? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're MNR Marketing. Um, you can uh, find us on our website uh, at m and r hyphen or dash group.com. Looks like we have one other question come in. Oh, hi, Isabel. So, Isabel, fun fact I, I like to call her my mentor. She actually taught me about journey mapping um, as a form of research. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> given the cre creative nature of your business, what tools did you use with your team to still be able to be creative while remote? You mentioned you're back in the office now. Are you still leveraging these tools? Yes. Um, <laughs> remotely, to stay creative, um, I felt like I spent all day on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I was so zoomed out uh, after about two months of that. Uh, I could, you know, I, just, I was working from home, and so my wife was at home, and she was having to be quiet because I was on Zoom all day long with my team. Um, we uh, and I and for us, that's such a big part of our creative process. And it's us getting together as a team to brainstorm all these things. You know, what's that strategy going to be? What's this? Who's who's the target of this piece? You know, what type of messaging is going to be effective on this piece? And what does the creative need to look like? All of that requires a lot of communication. And so uh, our team was was on Zoom a lot all day long. Um, so communication for us, you, know, you mentioned that we're back in the office now. Um, and that is one thing that is, it's nice about being back in, in our office is that that communication is much easier. Uh, cause now you can just you know, sit in a conference room with one person on one side of the table and somebody else six feet away on the other side of the table, uh, with masks on and, uh, you can, you know, talk about projects. Um, 
But for us, communication is a huge part of our creative process. Um, um, and during it's all about sales. So um, Trudy wants to know, were there any other platforms besides Zoom that you use with your team remotely? Yeah, so we have a few platforms that we use. Um, you know, uh, we use the Adobe Suite for our creative, um, and that's a that's an online. You know, you can access the that software um, online. Uh, we use to manage all of our projects. We use a plat uh, a software called uh, Teamwork. Um, so that's an online platform uh, that everybody on our team has access to and it helps us manage our projects from start to finish, from scheduling to time tracking to a messaging system that's built into it. Um, but it, it's where all of our projects are managed and that's an online platform. We of course use Zoom for a lot of communication. We use uh, Teamwork has a chat uh, platform that our team would oftentimes use uh, to communicate on simple things that didn't require, a, you know, a, a conference call. Um, our sales team uses HubSpot uh, to manage our leads, uh, <laughs> and uh, we use HubSpot a lot. Um, <laughs> All right, Matthew. You Notice know you already know it's. I don't know what. Uh, <laughs> that was. I was distracted. Who's your favorite employee? So Matthew, my business partner, just hopped on chat and asked who my favorite employee is, and it would be Matthew. Matthew, you are so dear and near to my heart, and so special to me. I just thank you for all that you did. All right, and um, I guess the last final questions are, oh, Isabel mentioned that they've had good success with my boards within their geographically distributed innovation team. And um, is the cost of digital spend more expensive or less expensive than COVID? Uh, we, we really haven't seen any changes in overall the need for um, like actual digital spends costing more in terms of like per click or per view, uh, any shifts in, in those numbers going up, um, we would see some shifts in businesses wanting to allocate more of their budget to certain digital platforms. Um, but we didn't see the, the specific platforms increasing their rates that much. Okay. But well, thanks, Nick. Um, any final thoughts? Did you freeze? Yeah, my, so the AC in our office, the, the heat in our office upstairs is out. Um, and so it's freezing upstairs. Got right you. I was saying, did you freeze? Uh, not if you were freezing. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so I guess like another, right after Nick um, is going to be Jessica with SBDC. She's going to go over... Um, the business plan overview. So if you guys are um, in a stage of your business where you need um, to go through your business plan, this will be a great session for you. And yeah, and then Nick, this was really informative because I think like that was the biggest conversation during COVID. And I like the part where you talked about how you guys had already worked on your strategy. I think a lot of us were like that and you had to quickly like pivot, right? Um, for the year. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and definitely if somebody's going to be talking about business plans, uh, business plans are so important and it's something that, that we see oftentimes businesses don't have, um, especially if you're launching a new business or you're thinking through a new business. I can't express how important having a well thought through and detailed business plan is. Um, it can really make a huge difference because it makes you think about so many things that you need to think about that you may not normally just think through. Um, so 
Yeah, totally, totally. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, awesome. everybody. And also, guys, if you want to stick around, you can. Um, there's a networking tab. Don't be shy. There's a networking tab to the left of the screen. Go meet someone new and talk about your business. And you can come back at 1 o'clock. See you soon. Bye. Bye.